So um, very warm welcome to, to our fifth public lecture in the focal topic here, Justice and Sustainability. My name is Bernard Jurema, and I am part of the coordination team of the Justice Focal Topic at the Institute of for Advanced um, Sustainability um, uh, Studies. And I am also a research associate at the project um, Democratic Governance for Eco-Political Transformations. We are very uh, happy to have Tasnim Esop here today. And before introducing uh, her, I want to say a few words about today's topic on behalf of the Justice and Sustainability team. Um, as simultaneous crises amplify one another, the need for just transition towards more sustainable societies become ever more urgent. With the focal topic year, we at the IASS hope to elevate our understanding of the importance of justice and sustainability and want to shed more light on all the complex interactions between sustainability transformation and questions of justice. One of our activities in this public lecture series, which usually takes place every last Thursday um, uh, um, of the month, today is an exception, the dates um, for our upcoming lectures, but also for workshops or organizing can be found on our website. Also blog posts on the topics mentioned above and, and many more um, were published on the ISS website. So please check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter. If you want to learn more about our activities, they will be linked on, uh, in the chat. Um, Today, our topic will be uh, the critical role of civil society in climate action. Civil society participation is crucial to, the, to, to achieving justice and equity in sustainability, but there are many challenges to effective social participation, in particular, in particular by groups and people and regions which are unequally affected by the climate crisis. It is therefore of the utmost importance to understand how climate politics work and how society can most successfully exert influence over the policy instruments and transformation mechanisms that are available to tackle environmental problems and climate change. It is also important to understand how the climate policy forums oftentimes reinforce the status quo and undermine the quest for justice. Today, Dasnim Mesop will highlight challenges, but also opportunities and emphasize the importance of building truly democratic and participatory and just approaches to climate action to achieve climate justice. Um, currently, previously unparalleled climate phenomena, rising poverty and famine due to energy prices and food crisis are stark, stark reminders that usually the people who are least responsible for the climate crisis are the ones suffering the most from it. Therefore, it is fundamental to include different sectors of global society into climate politics forums. That is why we are thrilled to have as our guest today, someone with the experience and knowledge of Tasnim so that we can better understand um, how this can be achieved. And so to introduce our guest, I pass the word to Sebastian Helgenberg. Thank you, Bernardo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure to facilitate um, this discussion uh, and this session and also to introduce Tasneem. I am the research group leader at the ISS Potsdam on social sustainability of climate action and energy transitions. So we're doing research that is closely linked to the topic of our today's session, and we have been also working in South Africa for quite a while. And Around four years ago, I think Tasneem and, and I, we met for the first time um, working together on the social economic opportunities of, of climate action with renewable energies in, in South Africa. And back in the time, and Tasneem Esop, she was a commissioner um, um, by the National Planning Commission, and she was commissioner for the trust, Just Transition Dialogues in South Africa. And some of you might have already heard about this really fascinating process and um, South Africa, also the government and the National Planning Commission really took in a leading role here also internationally, a, a role model how a civil society can be included in planning a just transition in the country. But as I've heard 
back then, and um, I'm sure we heard here that today, there are certainly many positive things to learn from, but I guess Tasnimi will also, we will also look in the, in the critical aspects and things that could be improved from the example of South Africa. Now Tasneem is with the Climate Action Network as Executive Director, joining us from Cape Town today. Tasneem also was with WWF before and also um, had a couple of um, roles in the in positions in the South African government and the regional government. So she really um, has looked into the topic of um, just energy transitions from, ver from various angles. So I think that would be also very beneficial for our today's discussion. Now, this is also not talking from, to you from, from Potsdam, from Germany. This is also a very timely conversation um, for us here in Germany, because next week, the Chancellor will visit South Africa. Um, Germany with South Africa and the EU and, and UK and a couple of other countries have formed the Just Transition Partnership, the JETP, in, our, in the last COP, in the last, last climate conference. And this is a partnership, this is still ongoing. Um, also in the development, so, and it would be interesting also just need to hear from you, what are your thoughts on that Just Energy Transition Partnership? And in that context, also the ISS is um, participating in a big conference next week in South Africa in the coal region of Pumalanga, where we will also present with our partners, South African partners, the results of the latest studies. So also for, from that perspective, um, very timely topic, I'm thrilled, um, to, to um, now introduce or hand the floor over to you, Tasneem, and um, yet to uh, let you share your thoughts on the top topic which Bernardo has already introduced. So civil society in climate forums, what are the challenges really to building consensus around the climate justice topic? And Tasneem um, announced she would talk around 20, 30 minutes, but we see. Um, um, Tasneem, also, you said that you would like to have that very inclusive. So I guess if someone of you listening has an intervention, would like to bring in an idea, please use the chat and then I leave it to you, Tasneem, to, to pick up thoughts from there to, um, to include it in your, in your talk or we can come back to that afterwards. With that, very happy. Tasneem, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian, and thanks for the introduction. And thanks to IASS for the invitation to, to speak. So as a disclaimer, um, this is being framed as a lecture, and I just want to already say I'm not going to be giving a lecture. What I really want to do is have a conversation about an issue as, as urgent and as challenging as that of climate justice. Uh, the conversation on uh, justice and sustainability, justice more broadly, social justice, and particularly climate justice, has never been, uh, you know, more urgent than at this time. The kind, the times that we are living through right now, um, as you can imagine, the context tees up very well this very important conversation about justice. We have been witnessing now uh, the past years with the COVID pandemic, now with the war in Ukraine uh, and many other conflicts around the world and increasing climate impacts being experienced also across the world um, that in fact, we are living through times of immense injustice across the board immense inequities across the board, uh, ranging from, you know, many of you would know the, the struggles we fought around vaccine equity, um, you know, the issue that rich nations, unfortunately, had turned inward, taking care of their own needs, not looking at uh, the way one would display international solidarity and support for those who had no access to vaccines, and especially, again, in those more vulnerable and, and uh, uh, um, least developing countries. So the issue of vaccine equity was right there for us to all bear witness to nothing that could be ignored. And of course, the implications then of the pandemic on economic development, uh, the fact that we have been witnessing rising, dramatically rising inequalities, and we have been witnessing rising poverty, rising unemployment, 
And so within that context, again, I do want to congratulate IASS for forefronting the issue of justice. And here I would not make a distinction between uh, you know, justice more broadly and climate justice, because these are all connected. This important aspect of us also recognizing more and more the interconnections be between social justice issues, climate justice issues, human rights, human development, sustainable development, all of these gender rights, all of these are connected and cannot be ignored in a conversation about climate justice. And uh, the exciting part, uh, you know, we've of course living through very challenging times, but what that has resulted in is also something that is positive in the sense that these intersectionalities are becoming far more clearer and impossible to ignore. And that's important. And it is with that backdrop, I think that the, the way civil society and the wider climate movement is starting to recognize that you can not address the issue of climate or achieve climate justice if we do not see all of this together. I do want to then, just by way of a big kind of overview, share a slide, a graphic from the IPCC Working Group 2 report, the recent report that was um, um, produced, that uh, tries to pull these things together, I thought, actually quite quite well, um, you know, the connecting of the dots, the coupling of these issues. And so I'm not sure, I hope many of you have read the Working Group 2 report, it was a devastating report, but also absolutely, uh, you know, not unique necessarily, but the fact that far more clearly now and more sharply are these relationships being brought forward. And so, you know, when we look at what we're dealing with in terms of climate and its connections with sustainability, with uh, justice, with equity, I thought that this graphic really pulls things together in terms of where we are at, what those connections are in terms of what we do around reducing emissions, etc. but the impacts on both human society and our ecosystems in terms of the actions we take around climate change and what we need to do for the future, uh, especially looking at what is needed for building climate resilient development, this kind of connection and connecting of the dots are important. And why I'm presenting this is that, you know, when we move from the current crisis, dealing with the current crisis to where we need to be in the future, and here the future isn't you know, the future in decades and decades, we're really talking about the very narrow window of opportunity, which is an additional uh, challenge. That future and the way we get there, the how and the what cannot be anything but the, the forefronting of justice. Because this is not a technical exercise where we, you know, we're going to address the climate crisis and the wider um, crises related to, to humanity and ecosystems uh, as a technical process. There's been many attempts uh, that I think this report also then helps to, to, to guide us. Many attempts to assume that the climate crisis is going to be ad uh, addressed purely through the setting of targets to reduce GHG emissions. And with these science reports, it is just hitting us totally, um, you know, hard in terms of the recognition that that did not go far enough. And certainly the actions that we are taking to address the climate uh, crisis uh, uh, is not uh, leading us to where we need to be in terms of uh, the risks of even a 1.5 degree temperature limitation. And so we are really dealing with a crisis that essentially signals to us that we are living in an era already because of the lack of dramatic and urgent action to reduce emissions, we're living in an era of climate impacts. 
Why am I forefronting this? Why is this important? Because of exactly what Bernardo says. It is those who are least responsible for this crisis and other crises, least responsible who are bearing the, the brunt of the burdens of this crisis, the impacts of this crisis. And that is the fundamental injustice that we have to address. So let's talk about justice. You know, climate justice, like the language around just transition, like the language around sustainable development has become a really, you know, in a way, a mainstream, it's part of our lexicon. Everybody's talking about climate justice. It was not a mainstream concept before. There are many social movements, especially in the global south, who were, of course, struggling and struggling and fighting to uh, deal with the issue of climate justice. And it is only in recent times that this uh, language of climate justice is becoming far more mainstream. To the, I mean, there are more conversations about climate justice, but we need to interrogate, and this is the kind of conversation I want to have with all of you, what do we mean by climate justice? We use this framing, but what does it mean? And so for me, essentially, of course, justice is about ensuring that there is equity, that there is fairness, that there are rights based approaches, that it's democratic practices that we respect, uh, et cetera. So it's a moral, it is a legal component to this imperative to ensure that especially those who are least responsible for these crises do not bird, uh, get burdened with them. And in fact, that there's a redress, that we have to redress the injustices. And in a climate context, that means that we have to forefront, of course, the needs and uh, the, the need to protect and support those who are bearing uh, the, the brunt of this crisis. And the forms in which that would take are in fact really critical. You know, we can't just talk about climate justice without understanding the implications for that. And that would mean we would have to look at the distributive justice element. In other words, what are we putting in place globally and locally? What mechanisms, what policies, what processes are we putting in place to ensure that there is just distributive uh, impacts in terms of how we deal with the climate crisis and other social crises. The second area for the, you know, to ensure justice is of course, the procedural justice element. And this is a fundamental issue that we're not taking seriously now. It's about decision-making. Who sits at the decision-making table? Who's participating in decision-making processes? What do those processes actually look like to ensure that they are in fact procedurally just. And finally, especially in relation to sustainable justice, the issue of intergenerational justice is also an important area for us to consider and, and work on. And so if we look at the, the, what needs to be done to achieve climate justice, it is not an easy, there's no easy, quick fixes to this, and yet we are being challenged in the fact that for a climate crisis, we do not have a lot of time. So let's think about that. You need fundamental procedural justice to ensure that there's just outcomes and that there's redress. Procedural justice means that the those who need to be at the decision-making tables need to be capacitated, supported, resourced, valued, respected, relationships built, power dynamics addressed. Does not take, it's not a quick process. These are going to be serious issues. 
One of the challenges about procedural justice right now is that it is entirely or mostly performative. You know, many of you, when governments have their processes, you, you, they have consultations, etc. They largely, okay, we're going to consult this community or that uh, civil society group or whatever they do, tick box exercises. It's not meaningful, real democratic participation in decision making. So here we have a challenge. Procedural justice needs to be taken seriously in the context of climate. Uh, you know, it might be a challenge just given the time frames as well. So what can we do to ensure procedural justice? Distributive justice. You know, right now uh, we have a very, and, and I want to refer to Sebastian's point, for example, around the just energy transition um, partnership that was established with South Africa. We have governments who are mainly focusing on the energy transition. Of course, important. One of the most key uh, interventions in terms of addressing the climate crisis is to address uh, the energy um, a transition. Communities who are impacted, that will be and are impacted by a potential energy transition or the existing extractive destructive nature of extractive uh, uh, sectors and the fossil fuel industries are not at the decision-making tables. So we have a great partnership. Uh, Sebastian, the governments are all going to get together. There's a signal that there's going to be funding. Again, it's going to come down to who's at the decision-making, who's actually deciding what this partnership looks like. It's a government-to-government -government partnership. The communities are not there. The workers are not there. And they should be. What is that funding going to be used for? Is it going to be used to, you know, uh, invest in renewable in, uh, energy infrastructure? Or is part of that going to be looking at funding social protection measures for workers and communities who will be adversely affected by the phasing out of coal, for example? So that distributive element, the distributive justice element is something that has to be looked at far more sharply and will not naturally be put on the table if those communities themselves are not part of the process. So the two are very connected. You cannot achieve distributive justice without procedural justice. The two are fundamentally connected. And overall, you will not achieve a just outcome, social justice, climate justice, without these as well. So that's the one big piece that I think we need to engage on. The second part of the conversation around justice, of course, and yeah, I want to connect to the international fora, is the fact that you have inter, well, between countries, inequity, so between rich nations and poorer nations, uh, between the global north and the global south more generally, if you want to talk about that, equity and injustice, inequity and injustice is of course a very big feature of, of that relationship. But in addition, and what we're seeing more and more um, is of course the inequities within countries. And uh, often in the discussions about uh, the burdens, who bears the burdens the cli of climate impacts, we often tend to think that this is a, a global south, a developed nations versus developing nations problem. Whereas I think it's going to be acutely important for us to remember that in, within nations, who's the vulnerable? Who are vulnerable? Not who's the vulnerable, sorry. Let me rephrase that. Who are most vulnerable? Again, we will look across this and we will see it's exactly the same sections of our society. Those who are largely marginalized already, those who live in poverty, those who suffer inequality, those who are discriminated against, those living in conflict, etc., who are again most vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis. Indigenous peoples, for example, black communities, people of color, women, 
the aged, etc. So even though the ability to rebound after climate impacts uh, would be different, the ability to adapt to climate would be different uh, between these. These communities and peoples are pretty much the same. The same sections who were the worst impacted by a pandemic, for example. The same sectors of society that's burdened by uh, food crisis, energy crisis, etc. So essentially, the people at risk are pretty much the same. Uh, in terms of the same sections of our society. A and here, of course, socioeconomic status is a key aspect of this. So the inter and intra relationships in terms of equity and justice is something that we need to inter country, inter country and intra country uh, aspects is another area for us to investigate. At a global level, uh, as many of you follow, for example, the UNFCCC process, the, the multilateral uh, in, uh, uh, system for climate, this issue of fairness and justice and equity has been the one fundamental blockage in those uh, multilateral, in that multilateral process. Uh, clearly, the principle of historic responsibility is something that is meant to be a guiding principle, but we would know, of course, that most of the times when developed countries need to step forward to take that historic responsibility, they often firstly challenge it, and secondly, do not. And a very clear example of that is the fact that the uh, rich nations have yet to fulfill their commitments to providing finance for uh, climate and for developing countries to address the climate crisis. So while there are aspects of a multilateral system that recognizes this component of justice, this element that we have to take into account that historic responsibility and that we have to then look at the redress of that and address that's about redress and justice, there isn't a full understanding of that as a justice issue, but necessarily by developed countries, and they do not actually act in terms of ensuring that that justice prevails, both in terms of who needs to do what in terms of the redu uh, reducing greenhouse gas em emissions, who needs to fulfill the obligations of support and financial support and technology support, et cetera, these issues to redress the issues of injustice is something that is still a huge challenge in the international space. And this is where civil society really has stepped into the breach. This is the role that civil society plays in the multilateral process. Uh, we come in as civil society, of course, not just to push the levels of, you know, push governments to increase their levels of ambition, which we do, but we also act in the interest uh, of ensuring justice, especially to those who have, are experiencing the injustice most sharply. And the way we do that is of course, prioritize the issues that would be able to then achieve justice and, and achieve the redress that's needed. And as we, are witnessing in this past years now, the issue of climate impacts, the issue of loss and damage that we're already experiencing has come up as a very key justice issue. Uh, you know, it's not a political uh, and technical story. The losses and damages are happening. The science has confirmed this, and yet there's no support for loss and damage. And again, it's the same sectors of our society are bearing the brunt of this, these impacts of, of, of climate change that we're witnessing already. So civil society has clearly made these issues of uh, ensuring justice for those who are most vulnerable, peoples, communities, countries, as their big priority. But the systems are not set up for real meaningful civil society. Multilateral processes are 
party-driven processes. In other words, governments are at the table. They make the decisions. Civil society's participation at best in these processes is we on the sides doing our advocacy work. We do all kinds of uh, activities around that. We reach out uh, and do political advocacy work. We get the opportunity to say something in about two minutes in some interventions in some plenary that takes place in the early hours of the morning when the governments have left. And we do not have a meaningful seat at the table as civil society. When I talk about civil society, I do want to uh, also refer to uh, what that means. Civil society is not just NGOs. We, I want to use the broader description of civil society that includes trade unions. Well, then, you know, wouldn't be, I wouldn't call them civil society, but labor, all our key constituencies, labor, uh, women and gender constituencies, indigenous people who are considered civil society, by the way, but in fact, here is the other injustice. Indigenous peoples are considered civil society in a multilateral process when in fact they are nations, not recognized. So the whole, the whole colonial aspect of our multilateral system, the, the fact that the, these systems from colonialism right through to capitalism, to neoliberalism, that has in a way been the cause of all these crises, and that is still pretty much institutionalized in the way we are governed, multilateral systems, et cetera. That is also part of a big, uh, well, we should talk about governance injustice. Um, so with that perspective of who are you really talking about when we're talking about civil society in its broadest sense, in other words, just non-state non actors, that's us but we don't have a seat at the table. We do not have any opportunity to contribute towards decision-making. In fact, in many cases, we are shut out of the processes. We've had really bad experiences where we were not allowed into rooms to be part of and uh, you know, bear witness to what is being negotiated in, in behind doors, et cetera. So there are limitations for our role as civil society in terms of our pressure to ensure climate justice, which in itself is a procedurally unjust uh, issue that we are dealing with. When I move from the international space to the domestic space, where a lot of the work on, for example, the just transition is happening in many countries across the world, you will know, again, that impacted communities and workers are not necessarily at the decision-making tables. This is the experience that we had in South Africa and that Sebastian was referring to. When I was in the National Planning Commission, uh, the government was, well, they, they didn't really understand just transition at that point in time, but certainly because we led the process as the commission on the just transition, there was no way that exactly for the reasons that I've spoken about, distributive justice, achieving that, procedural justice, that you could do anything on the just transition in South Africa without having workers and impacted communities and communities more broadly at the table. And so my big concern about these just transition processes that's currently underway and the thinking around it and potentially future just energy transition uh, processes is that they're not going to take the procedural justice issues seriously enough, which would mean that we would not necessarily achieve just outcomes. And so the just transition, and Sebastian would have heard me say this before, is not about transition necessarily. It is about the justice element of the transition. That's what needs to be emphasized. Transitions are happening, but how do we ensure that they are in fact just is something that we need to talk about. And I want to conclude by saying that we really have to recognize that this is deeply political. And now when I say political, I'm not saying this is about governments. This is political in the sense that achieving justice and ensuring fairness and equity 
is all about power, all about power. And if we do not address the issue of power, who has resources, who makes decisions in the world and domestically, and look at what is happening right now about how elites in the world have actually, you know, the kind of inequity and the, the, the narrowing of that kind of base of elites, who owns what, who is actually um, making the powerful uh, interventions and, and uh, uh, ensuring that there's really, really the, the kind of inability to be far more just and democratic across the world. I cannot think of any place where we don't have this challenge. Democracy itself is being challenged across the world. Then this issue of justice, procedural justice, and distributive justice becomes far, far more important and should be one of the key aspects of the work that we do as climate activists, as part of the climate movement, as academics, as uh, you know, researchers, as uh, ordinary citizens. This is the key issue, I would argue, um, for us to all take note of and in a very deep and serious and meaningful way, not just in a performative way. We speak the language and our practices are different. And the last and final point I want to say about civil society, civil society itself needs to reflect about this issue because civil society pretty much reflects and is a mirror of the wider, is a microcosm of the wider unfair and unequal and in, unjust practices themselves in terms of power, in terms of resources, in terms of who actually dominates and makes decision making, you know, who makes these decisions, who sets agendas, even in a civil society space. And as a network, as the network that I lead, which is a global network, these issues of inequity and, uh, um, you know, fairness and resource access, etc., plays out very strongly in such a network. And hence, issues of decoloniality, uh, of that being an important element of ensuring justice is something we cannot ignore as well, all of us. And so I'm going to leave on that point. I will leave off my intervention and I really look forward to the engagement. I've tried to be as, uh, I think as frank as possible because these kinds of conversations cannot be left at the level of, um, uh, uh, you know, not being provocative. We need to be provoking each other because this is a very serious, we are at serious risk as humanity uh, if we do not actually deal with the issue of injustice, injustice in a real way. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the engagement. Thank you so much, uh, Tasneem, for this um, amazing um, uh, talk. Uh, we, um, I will now hand over to, to Kathleen Marr. Kathleen is, uh, she leads the group Climate Action, National in the, Climate Action in National and International Processes. And so she will um, comment um, on, we, on what we just heard uh, before we move on to taking some questions from, from our audience. Um, please, Kathleen. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Tasneem. Um, it's an honor to have you here as part of our ISS lecture series and also to meet you in a sense virtually. Um, part of my work as a group leader at ISS is coordinating um, our activities at the UN climate conferences. So at the COPs and there, obviously, Canada International has a huge presence. Um, so I have the, the good fortune of being able to uh, start off the discussion and really I have two major questions that I'd like to pose to you. Um, 
getting a bit more into the details of your work. So you are the director of Can International, which I think most people know, but just from your website, um, Can International is the world's largest environmental network of over 1,500 non-governmental organizations in over 130 countries. Um, so I think it's clear civil society itself is not a monolith and to become part of Can International, I think, you know, there's some common goals you have to ascribe to, but I'm curious um, also kind of with the, with the with, through the lens of procedural justice, how you manage the diversity within your members. And then my second question um, also on this topic of procedural justice, I'd be curious to hear from you what your vision would be for a reformed COP, for a reformed UN process. I can expect that the answer will involve, okay, more participation, more rights for civil society, let's say, but how could that actually look in practice? Because um, as one of the, a couple of comments in the chat allude to is one thing, um, to organize participatory processes at a local level. It's another thing to do at a global level, really just in a practical sense. So how, if you, if you could completely reform the COP, what would you do? Thank you so much. Thanks, Bernardo, do I respond to, or do, are you planning to take a set of questions? So I reply to you directly now. Yeah, you can reply now, Catherine's questions, oh, right. and then we move on to, to take uh, more questions from the audience. Great. Now, thank you very much for, for your reflections, Kathleen, and your questions. So let me deal with the CAN um, question, our, our network. And yes, it is a global network of organizations growing as well. Um, and so I, I, I do want to be a bit, because it's important to, to reflect on this as a, as a way of maybe help, being helpful to, to others who want to also now transform. Um, Ken's, history, Ken's history has been one of global North domination, largely European, US-based uh, network of organizations, very dominated by uh, the kind of insider uh, work that we did in the UNFCCC, very policy, climate diplomacy oriented. And, and for many years, we're over 30 years old, by the way. And, and there's always been the challenge, not just in the CAN uh, network, but in the members, the big members. The, uh, CAN has every, almost every single big logo you can think of as a member from Greenpeace to WWF to Action Aid, et cetera, et cetera, also growing. Now, the challenges, of course, was how do you ensure, firstly, in a, in a space that has been largely and is largely, no, has been global North dominated, how do you ensure global South representation and the voice and the needs and the priorities reflected in such a dynamic and diverse organization? So, what have we done in recent times? Recognizing, uh, well, uh, at least I can speak for myself under my leadership, that we needed to transform this network exactly because of the issue. You can't talk climate justice and this is your practice, right? So we, we put in place a number of measures. Firstly, we looked at mechanisms to address resource inequity in our network. In other words, we've, you know, right now our global north you know, nodes have a lot of resources. We have Global South nodes, these are geographical nodes, literally uh, having people who do work on a voluntary basis. That's an inequity, that's an injustice. So we put in place mechanisms to address resource inequity and we raise funds and we shift all of that to the Global South nodes to support them, to build their capacity, to make sure that they can do the work, not on voluntary basis, uh, but to be compensated for that. So the first thing was shifting resources. The second one is to get, of course, far more robust uh, involvement and participation in the work we do. And again, here we've set up structures to ensure that that happens. We have a Global South Caucus, for example, they prefer, 
prepare for all the kind of decision-making processes within the network itself. And they come into those decision-making processes fully prepared and to have voice and to set agendas. Thirdly, the network itself has made a decision that we would be led by the global south. So, for example, the decisions that we made around the vaccine inequity story last year was led by the Global South nodes. We took that principled stand as a network because we were being led by the Global South. This year for the COP, for example, we are being led by Africa and our Arab world node. We're being led by it as a network. So we don't only have these Global North policy experts leading the network any longer, we are now being led far more in a bottom-up way from our nodes and specifically our Global South nodes. So we've changed the organization to become far more bottom-up and especially far more um, led by the Global South. And then very importantly, what we're also doing now is putting the network through a process of decoloniality. So the first thing we're doing and we've just done, and of course this will depend on how much resources we can get, We've put our leadership through decoloniality training as a first step. And we're going to be rolling that out in the network. And we are looking at how our institutions and our practices can already start changing to ensure the decoloniality of our network. And so, yes, it, it, what is needed is a very conscious and deliberative program to transform, to ensure just procedural justice, but not just procedural justice, to ensure justice across the board, right? Um, and so as a network, many challenges, but we needed to do this and we are doing the best we can. We will learn a lot, we will struggle, it's a challenge, but we are taking the steps to do this kind of transformation as a network. I'm very happy to share our experiences um, and what these challenges, and very happy to hear from others uh, and, you know, in terms of advice and guidance. So that's on the CAN front, Kathleen. In terms of this reformed UNFCCC process, you, you basically gave me a blank check to, to dream, I suppose, right? So let me... My, but we've had these engagements, actually. We're currently engaging with the UNFCCC in a process uh, around meaningful observer participation. But one of the things that I've always been thinking about, these multilateral, these international governance processes, which of course doesn't, uh, isn't procedurally just, is having a paradigm shift around it and not seeing a multilateral process as a cop necessarily, right? We're all busy, 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 and then we end up at a cop. What if we saw a multilateral process as an ongoing process that really comes off from the bottom? That in-country processes, which are inclusive and participatory, deal with the matters that, that need to be dealt with at hand. That's the implementation, for example. Uh, now I'm not talking about these crazy little negotiations on some text in the, I'm talking about the real meaningful issues. How are we going to mobilize resources? How are we going to build resilience? What, you know, all these kinds of issues, what are the needs of communities uh, who are most vulnerable? As part of a process that's coming off, off the bottom. So you have in-country participatory and inclusive processes that could lead up to regional processes. And currently the UNFCCC has these kind of, uh, I suppose, event type regional weeks, climate weeks, which could turn into far more meaningful uh, multilateral process. And then you land in a COP process that really isn't isolated from the kind of realities that you are then building up from the bottom and from the experiences, the lived experiences of people. I, that would be one part of my vision, right? That we shift completely out of this kind of international multilateral COP type approach to ongoing processes that are really bottom up and participatory and meaningful. The second piece about then the COP itself, look, I mean, as I said, we're currently looking at our meaningful participation. I wouldn't be one to say, oh, you know, everybody, we need more participation by civil society, et cetera. It's not the quantity. 
that I'd be concerned about at the cost. It's not the numbers. Yeah, great to have many numbers. It's that quality of participation that I'd be far more uh, keen to address. And the issue that this kind of party-driven approach, that's my other dream, that we shift multilateral systems away from party-driven processes, that they're actually social partner-driven processes, that we have the key partners at the table making decisions, deciding how we collectively address a crisis that is a collective problem. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my dream and vision for a very total, totally different multilateral process and definitely very differently structured in terms of who's at the table for decision-making. I hope that's a response to your question, Kathleen. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, now we have uh, we have questions from the audience, and then we go to Sebastian. Is that okay, Sebastian? Okay. So yeah, we have a question here in the, in the comments uh, from Camille Vernier Cambron. Uh, in, she says, um, in terms of democratic process, how do we reconcile top-down expert-led efficiency and bottom-up bottom-up participatory deliberation? How do we bridge global uh, in local scales to facilitate rapid and just change. Um, taking from another angle, how do we decolonize our decision-making process to empower change from the bottom up without imposing Western valuation systems, but while still maintaining our common climate biodiversity development goals as the desired outcome? Uh, also, we have another comment here from Malik, Malika. Um, she says, totally agree with the last point. I think she, she was referring to, to your last point in the initial talk, how civil society often reproduce power and in this way reproduce injustice. Thank you, Tasnim, for the courage to speak your truth. And, and Halid Dennis uh, said, uh, loved, loved it. So there you go. Um, maybe we also can um, take Sebastian's questions and then you can answer uh, all of them together. I think that would be uh, too much if I'm adding now my question. Um, I would come in later. Ah, okay. Thanks, ben. By the way, thanks, Bernardo, for taking over the facilitation because um, I experienced some instabilities in my internet connection. So it's good that it's in your good hands now. So if it's okay for you, then I would come in later. Yeah, of course. Okay, then we go go back to Tasnim. Thanks uh, very much, and and thanks Camille for the question. I think maybe I touched on some of this in my response to Kathleen's point about how I would imagine a new UNFCCC multilateral process to look like, and and that is building this off the from the bottom up, from local through to to regional to international. Um, and But I do want to talk a little bit about this kind of Western, how, without imposing a Western system. And, and again, I'm going to speak frankly. Um, there is a notion or some perception in the world that truth and knowledge and expertise and capacity largely comes from the West, from the North. That's a given that even applies to think tanks, to research institutions. And I'm saying this with all due respect. And that often that kind of relationship of power, knowledge, etc., uh, uh, means that it will always be Western, Northern that dominates. That's, been, that's even been the history of the UNFCCC process. Research institutions, uh, think tanks, uh, all of these, largely dominated by the North. So in a serious and meaningful transformation away from Western dominated uh, systems, knowledge systems, etc., and here I think we should go again to reading what the IPC, I must say I have such immense respect for what the IPCC has moved into the space they've moved into the kind of intersectionality of, of, you know, of the sciences themselves, where they have consistently referred to this as a challenge themselves. 
the scientists, basically referring to us, uh, respect indigenous knowledge, respect local knowledge systems, recognize the history of colonialism uh, in terms of the, what we are experiencing today. You know, so for the IPCC to put that C into our frame, the C word, the colonialism, is a big step forward. Again, we have to take that seriously. We can't cherry pick science. We can't refer just to, you know, the kind of uh, greenhouse gas mitigation targets that need to be set. Look at the full scope of what these scientific reports have come out with, and you will find your guidance and answers there. And it, that's the one part of it. The other part is to constantly and with courage and with respect from all sides, constantly forefront the power dynamic, the uneven, unequal power dynamic between those from the you know, Western um, powerful institutions and uh, in relation to the global South and call it out. I, I must be honest, I have, I suppose it's a, a kind of a, a generational thing, but, and because we're living in such an unbelievable time of crises, that the time for diplomacy, you know, is fast moving away. We really have to talk frankly to each other. We really have to be able to respectfully challenge each other. We really have to say, well, your practice, quite frankly, is pretty much post-colonial or colonial or whatever. We need to look each other in the eye because we are all in this together. The impacts are differently felt and differently experienced, et cetera, but we have a global crisis for humanity and the planet. And so for me, that point about speaking truth to power, honesty, learning, um, reflecting, changing is part of our collective responsibility. And as civil society, as I said, we have to be there. We have to step up. We are the ones that's expected. You know, we call on governments to transform, businesses to transform, but we have to also lead the way in terms of this um, transformation and, and talking truth to power and changing power dynamics as an important role that we need to play in this period as well. I'm not sure if that helps, uh, Camille, in your, with your question. Yeah, that was an incredible answer. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for, for participating. Uh, so now we, we can go uh, we can go to Sebastian. Um. Neem, you, you had so many different positions um, and I have experienced many different kinds of involvements from, from civil society organizations. So you, you, you must be full of experiences like positive and negative ones, like what worked, what didn't. It would be fantastic if you could share um, some of that, for example, if you have also some experience where you really saw how a good um, was procedural involvement of, of civil society has really um, not just, yeah, has led to, to more just outcomes, but perhaps has also improved the process. Um, and I'm also thinking, because so far we are this the conversation is very much i would say value driven a normative conversation and i would share that um, however we know there are quite many people organizations out there that wouldn't share that and the question is in the short time we have um are there also additional more perhaps functional arguments which we can make for for stronger involvement and inclusion of civil society organizations so also for that it might be helpful to have have examples to say hey it also it also makes sense for other reasons or perhaps if you also have examples where there was not a sufficient involvement of a civil society organization and then the whole process took 20 years longer or so also to have that as an example why it also from a functional pers perspective makes sense to um to go about it Thanks. Yeah. So I, I do want to 
use the example, in fact, of the, the, the just transition dialogue process in South Africa. So for those who don't know, you know, we took this kind of, well, not entirely bottom up, um, but we, we did a, a, a social pi partner dialogue. So social partners in South Africa would be government, business, labor, and community civil society. That's our four social partners in South Africa. So we had these social partner di dialogues in all of our provinces in the country, uh, essentially, you know, getting social partners to, to look at and build consensus around a vision for 2050, what are the key priorities in terms of a tr transition to ensure a transition is just, uh, in terms of energy, water, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it was really a kind of inclusive, not just dialogue, but uh, collective co-creation of ideas and thoughts and thinking to build consensus, identify the lack of consensus where they were. And of course, you know, these different constituencies, these partners would have different uh, agendas and different interests and power. One of the things that I then, realized in, we first ran a few, and I realized that that power dynamic played out very strongly. I was listening to the voices of those who had the most power in the room, and that was mainly government and business. Communities, impacted communities who are involved, weren't setting agendas, weren't leading the conversations, etc. So I took a different approach in, you know, the ones that we rolled out later, and, and deliberately went and met with impacted communities before the formal process. So had engagements with the communities themselves outside of that power dynamic where all of the partners are together and really had deeper meaningful engagement to be able to understand what the communities were prioritizing, their needs, their challenges, their solutions it changed the dynamic completely and, and then made very clear that when they entered into the wider process of all the social partners, it is going to be their voice who is going to be the most, that will set the, the agenda, made it very clear. And that kind of deliberative addressing of a power dynamic and recognizing it and understanding it is very important. So it's a key, key lesson that I learned. And I think should be learned for all uh, future processes or whoever's running a process and whatever that process might be. So that was really important. And, and to be honest with you, Sebastian, if you say, so how did that meaningfully change? It shifted the dynamic dramatically. I'm not sure if you, I can't recall actually whether you were part of the entire process when we had to come finally to a big concluding conference to get the consensus one of the important things in the country, as you know, in South Africa, the whole coal, phasing out coal was a big battle to get, uh, reach consensus on that. From labor to the private sector, et cetera. But we managed to build that consensus. The decision in that concluding conference was, yes, we need to phase out coal in South Africa. We need to do this by 2050, but it must be done through a just transition. We would not have reached that agreement. I promise you that. If it wasn't for the involvement and engagement of impacted communities and their voice in the process, because we would have had a battle still by the other vested interests in South Africa. So it's an important, additional, very powerful constituency that can shift the discussions and the course and the direction by being at the tables at the start. So I wanted to present that as a concrete example. The other one also linked to the work we did there. In South Africa, the big focus of the just transition has always been this coal phase out, right? The energy transition, the energy transition, the voices and the powerful voices in the coal space, whether it's from the labor unions to government departments, through the private sector, was, all, was the ones that dominated. And, and of course, the conflicts arise. In this process of the National Planning Commission just transition work, when we went to provinces, like other provinces outside of the coal province, we then realized 
that in fact, our just transition work has been very mitigation focused. Whereas actually in the country, there were sectors of the, you know, the sectors of our economy that were already facing the impacts of climate change. So you might know we had a massive drought in South Africa, had a huge impact on the agricultural sector and on the tourism sector, et cetera. Job losses, by farm workers lost their job. Nothing was said in any newspaper. It wasn't a, an issue that was taking the headlines. And yet there were over 64,000 people who had just lost their jobs during a drought. And that then also triggered another understanding that if we don't see the just transition from an impacts perspective as well, and we only look at it from a mitigation perspective, we're not going to achieve distributive justice either. And so that is the other lesson learned, again, off the back of impacted communities participating, having their voice heard, and setting agendas. And so you know the just transition approach in South Africa is an economy-wide, society-wide approach. It's not just only meant to focus on the energy transition and it would have to fundamentally put into the, the, the frame the issues of climate impacts and building resilience and uh, ensuring adaptation, et cetera, et cetera, and protection. So I, I'd give you those examples. I, I mean, look, Sebastian, I'm really sorry. I know there's many examples that I can give you. The, there are, of course, um, experiences in the UNFCCC that uh, we can give you as examples of why it's critical for civil society. And I will give you one. It was last year in Glasgow. When we went to this COP, the issue of loss and damage and finance for loss and damage was not on the agenda of the COP. It wasn't on the agenda. We decided as CAN and wider civil society, just given the state of affairs in the world and the fact that these impacts were becoming more frequent, more devastating. And again, those who are most vulnerable, uh, least responsible. And so because of that, we decided whether this was an agenda or not, we're going to make it an agenda. I promise you that we made the issue of loss and damage finance, the big agenda issue for Glasgow. If anybody's been to Glasgow, if anybody looks at what's, of course we didn't win, but it wasn't even on the agenda. We got it put on the agenda to the point where the G77 plus China in a very unexpected way, literally put on the table text to set up a loss and damage finance facility, which was of course shut down by the rich nations, which we expected. But that is how the other lesson that we've learned, how civil society can use power, not only build power, but use power more um, pointedly. And so there are things that as civil society, we have the power to do. We've not been using that power enough and we should be using more and more so. So whether you at the table for decision-making or not, we have to recognize that we also have power and we should be able to use our power. Thank you uh, again, Tasnim. We have one, one question here from, uh, from Charlotte. Charlotte, uh, I wonder if you want to make your question to, to uh, speak it out loud, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I will read it here from, from the comments. Um, I can. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, as of, thank you so much for this presentation. I find it very inspiring. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm learning as well a lot. And I'm already like full on, oh, how could I do this with my organization? But still, I was actually wondering um, with the forum where you're working, um, like you said, that it is now led by the South, right? Or the members of the South. So, and then somehow I was asking myself like, yeah, but how can this be just? And as well, like maybe how did you find like a joint like decision on that, right? Like, yeah, 
I mean, not that I find it interest, but then at the same time, yeah, I find it very interesting. So I'm wondering how, how this is. Thank you. Or how yes, this no, is. Absolutely. Or... Yeah, no, let, let, me, let me be fair, actually. Um, when I say it's being led by the global South, I just mean it's the majority, right? So in the network, um, we are, we've moved towards what we call a bottom-up node-driven network. In other words, there are regional nodes and national nodes that exist in the network. And the majority of our nodes happen to be in the global South. So just by sheer majority, we're being led by the global South. But that doesn't translate into real meaningful leadership, right? In, in, a, in a way, the old power dynamics, the resource dynamics, the capacity dynamics still exist. And so we are in a transition in this transformation process. I'm not going to say we, you know, we've achieved the transformation. We're on a journey, but at least what we've done is been very conscious about the need for the change, been very conscious about the power inequities, the resource inequity. So it's the consciousness. Your first step actually is consciousness. Once you know there's a problem that needs fixing, then you put in place all the mechanisms that's appropriate for you to make those shifts and those changes. So yes, I mean, the Global South leads, uh, I, I'm saying it leads because it is the majority in terms of our nodes in the network. That's how our decision gets made through the nodes now. It's a bottom-driven network. Um, and you know we're also transforming some of our other decision-making platforms. But certainly, as you can imagine, the challenges still remain. Even if we are majority, it's the power, et cetera, uh, the ones who have the most resources, et cetera, that will still contribute a lot to our decision-making. So still on a journey, Charlotte, very challenging, but we are very committed to make the changes. I don't nice. know if that- Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte, for, for participating here. And thank you, Tasnim, for the answer. We have one question from Francesco Larufa. If you want to, to make it, take, uh, uh, ask your question, Francesco. Otherwise, I can read it here. Uh, but it would be better if you ask yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I uh, written because of the link. Also, I wanted to share the article, which I found it very good. But uh, yeah, my question is about this um, idea, with, because I share very much uh, the importance uh, of being. You insisted a lot on this issue, the dimension of power and procedural justice as a um, precondition for for distributive justice and. Uh, so the importance of being part and being sitting at the table where decisions are made, and I completely share this. But uh, on the other end, I was asking myself if, and you were starting uh, saying uh, similar uh, things right now about consciousness. The first step is uh, to raise consciousness. So this was the direction of my question. Also, um, to what extent we need first of all to to have this capacity to imagine different futures or to see ourselves as uh, or to see other potentialities with respect to the to the, the narrow present uh, which are uh, used to and so in this article uh, they make a the authors make a critique of the just transition and the mainstream as you also uh, have a critical position on this and um, yeah and for example, for overcoming this unequal um, or this power asymmetry between employers and workers, it, a first step, an essential step is to uh, have this ability to imagine ourselves as something else than just workers. And I find it, this is dramatically difficult. But thank you, this is, everything is very inspiring, so. Thank you, thanks very much, uh, Francisco. And, and so just to, I completely agree with you about this point about imagining a different world, an alternative world. And honestly, not to imagine it any longer. I, I think we are quite capable of knowing what kind of world we need, right? Um, and, and so 
But, but still, think... sorry for interrupting, but still, so many people, they want jobs. So this is important, right? Not so yeah, they, exactly. They, yeah, we want simply jobs. And this yeah. is... The, yeah, the this... thing is, what I'll chat that is exactly. So it's not about the challenge of imagining a future. It is then the challenge of winning the hearts and minds of people around that future as well. We can all sit, I mean, we as a network, we sit and, you know, we've developed a vision for the world we want, for example, but we do this in bubbles. Our biggest challenge is that we've not won the hearts and minds of the masses of people in the world. And that is why we sit with the struggle where right-wing populists are dominating, are starting to take the, the space that has been left behind because we've not been able to win our ideas and vision with the wider majority of people because people are acting out of fear more than out of imagination and potential and possibility. So that's our challenge. Um, and not just in the climate movement, it's a wider challenge for humanity. So I would agree, we should of course carry on imagining the future, but not only imagining it, really having the ideas for how this is possible. But for me, the biggest challenge is then go out and win the hearts and minds of people. You know, everybody talks about jobs, 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 because we're living in a capitalist system. The capitalist system is about, you have a, a job, you work for an employer, but what if in a world we imagine that is not just jobs, it is meaningful, a meaning, you lead a meaningful life, you are meaningfully engaged and in economy that is not necessarily about just profits for a boss, but you contributing to, you know, Taking it out, how do we reach, I know this might sound a bit 60s maybe, and I'm showing my generation, but you know, how do we take it out of this exploitative relationship that people have? Um, and, and, and that jobs, of course, is the only understanding of security and fulfillment. There might be other ways of doing it. So I agree with you. It's not you know, just about jobs, jobs, jobs. And so what would that future look like that isn't just about the short-term need and desire to feel secure through a job. Um, and what does meaningful participation in an economy look like if it's not through a job with a boss? Not that I'm saying there mustn't be any jobs with employers, but surely there has to be better ways of looking at all of these things. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. And, and, and the point about the just transition as you might know, the, the, U, not the, the ILO has a process where they have employers, government, and unions as the just transition tripartite. As civil society, we've actually been calling for, they might not change their, their structures and institutions, but for the just transition, if you don't have impacted communities, people who are unemployed, people who are in the informal sector, et cetera, involved in this process, again, you're not going to achieve procedural justice and therefore not entirely uh, distributive justice. So it's not just employers, employees and governments. The whole of society approach is something that we need to look at in terms of procedural justice as well. I don't know if I've answered your question, Francesco. Thank you, Tasnim. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, now we, we, yeah, we can have uh, another question from Sebastian. This is really a schizophrenic situation we're in. Um, I mean, I love what you said, Tasnim, um, to think about also to imagine how a good life could be and think beyond the capitalistic logic and so forth. I was just imagining ourselves we're sitting on the Titanic, which is about to sink. Yeah. And while trying to somehow save the ship, we're at the same time thinking about the bright future we might have when we arrive in New York. Yeah. So this is a bit the situation. And, and but I agree that we need to do it. It's just, um, just saving the Titanic. Um, I think we we need we need these these wonderful positive thoughts to put all our efforts in saving the, in preventing us from from um, 
from sinking with a ship. But I think that's that's the picture I got in my, in my head, and it that makes it makes it a bit complicated. Um, but it's nevertheless important also in the in these discussions about okay, how the hell are we going to to turn this around? Still, then have the positive vision, and and that brings me to another thought I I had which is about how I wrote in the chat, chat also acceleration of, of this decision making while making decision making inclusive. And that could be perhaps in, also in contrast and conflict to each yes. other, right? Because uh, Tazim, you were also mentioning right in the beginning, you were showing this, this graphic, that's really we're under extreme time pressure. Also IPCC report, if we look at the CO2 budget, that is still there. So at least if I'm looking at the industrialized country, Germany, uh, US, others, then our CO2 budget, like forever, will be consumed the next five years. <laughs> so, and uh, so this is this is the time pressure we're talking about. Um, and so that, that means we need far-reaching, quick decisions. And typically, procedural justice comes along with you need time to do that. Um, as, as one example, the country of South Africa with the chess transition dialogues did. Um, so this is also just a dilemma and we're all in. Um, if you would like to share some thoughts on that, it would be fantastic to hear ideas. I'm, I'm sure we cannot solve that, but I think we also have to be aware of that, that if we're not making decisions, far-reaching decisions quick enough, then it's too late. Yeah, yeah. So I want to respond in two ways, Sebastian, to your Titanic story. Uh, when, I, when I talk about an alternative vision or an alternative, not even an alternative vision and dream, it's not a dream, it's a necessity, right? I mean, even the science is saying, we need radical transformation of all our systems, our system even. So with that in mind, we need to be able to understand, so what does that look like? Where are we going to be on the other end of it? Now, I'm not saying this as a kind of optimistic dream and we're sitting on a Titanic kind of approach. What I'm saying is if we know exactly where we need to be, where we need to be, and what is wrong with the present, that's not going to be a nice, jolly conversation. I've said somewhere else, we need to build rage at what is wrong today. Real rage, it's not a, we think we're going to be all optimistic and we're positive and hopeful. No, no, no. We have a, a fundamental breakdown of all our current systems in the world right now, causing immense harm and injustice and inequity, cannot be made invisible any longer. You know, we can't avoid this. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. And in that context, we know we need to be in another place. We need a different system. We need to then rage against the current system. That's the one point I want to make. So it's not some kind of, we're going to spend time building optimistic scenarios for the future. We need to break down the current. We need to not even fix it, it must be broken. And we need to go to the, another, the other place. Then let me come with the procedural justice and the time and the tension that exists between potentially these things. You know, we don't, this is not a, a sequential story, right? That first we do this and we have all this neatly done and it's all procedural. I think we at the point now where everything needs to almost happen immediately and at the same time, but wherever we are, nothing prevents us from ensuring that processes already can be adjusted to ensure that we have some form of procedural justice, right? So I don't think we must just accept, for example, because of the urgency of time, that it's going to be okay for a government to make decisions on behalf of everybody or a business to make decisions on behalf of everybody. I say this because recently I've been really grappling with this point about we in an emergency, we need to reduce emission story. In the Northern countries, mostly, and a lot of our governments actually. You know, so I'll, I'm using a concrete example. What jumped out as one of the big things as a solution? Electric vehicles, right? EVs, 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 EVs. And in some forum somewhere, I sat there and I'm like, 
okay, I'm living in South Africa. I know the situation of those who are most vulnerable to this climate crisis. They bloody don't have a car. They don't have even roads. And you would know this, Sebastian, if you've been here. They don't, and this is the case for most informal settlements across the world. They don't have roads, streets. They don't have cars. They use uncertain public transport process, mechanisms, transport. But EVs have become and hugely invested in the big solution. Now, if we do that, if we went through a process of not ensuring procedural justice, ensuring that those most impacted by this climate crisis, if their voices and their priorities are not heard, we would spend a lot of money on infrastructure that is irrelevant, irrelevant to the lives of those who actually need the justice and the redress, right? We would put in a lot of EVs and we have a wonderful green future that's still unjust, unfair, and unequal. We'll have reduced emissions, give ourselves time maybe to breathe a few decades longer, but we would have continued on this path of injustice, inequity, and unfairness. So we have to invest in both the procedural justice piece so that we can have a distributive and a just outcome and the urgency with which that happens. And I think we can be as creative as possible to ensure that we achieve both. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tazim. Esop, uh, we have run out of time, but this was such a great note to end on to not, not only you have shared with us your, you know, the, your knowledge and experience about, you know, uh, uh, climate politics and how uh, in civil society participation, but the sense of urgency, I think it's so important, especially for us here, most of our audience and us in the Institute, we are, you know, citizens here in the global north. We have a huge responsibility in, in you know, leading the way and we have been doing, our governments have been doing the opposite of that. And so thank you for bringing your knowledge and also this very needed uh, sense of urgency. Um, I really appreciate that. I'm very um, honored you know, in name of our justice and sustainability team here and, and all of the institutes are honored to have had you with us. Um, and so thank you, thank you uh, so much. And thank you to everyone who, who joined us and who participated. I, before we finish, just a reminder that the next lecture will be will be uh, will take place on Thursday, June thirtieth, with Francisca Müller of the University of Hamburg uh, on hydrogen justice. So please look on our website for information, and also you can sign up to our newsletter, and you can follow us on Twitter. You can find all those links here on the chat. Thank you so much, everyone, and I hope to see you. In June and thank you again, Tasnim. And hope to see you soon, maybe in Berlin next time. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye.